Hey guys, it's time again to sit back and imagine you're back in the time of Blockbuster and Hollywood video. We're taking a look at even more popular video game rentals. I wanted to do a video on NES rentals of 1994 because this was during the twilight years of the system and I was curious to see what was popular for people not playing Super Nintendo or Genesis. And I'll cover other consoles and years in future videos so don't worry. Anyway, let's check out the top NES rentals of 1994. So let's kick things off with TMNT Tournament Fighters. I don't know about you, but when I think about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters, wow, that's a mouthful, <laughs> my brain goes to the Super Nintendo or the Genesis versions. But yeah, it was also released on the NES. It's a really rare game, and it was actually the last game that Konami developed for the Nintendo Entertainment System. I'd say it was a good way to usher in the new era of 16-bit fighting games. The Super Nintendo version is pretty fondly remembered, but I think because of the rarity and the fact that there is the superior SNES counterpart, this one gets overlooked. I like that the game starts off with a letter from Shredder challenging them to a fight. He's so catty. You can play as any of the four turtles, and if you're playing in two-player mode, you can play as some extra characters too, like Casey Jones, Hothead, and Shredder. I'm not sure if Hothead was on the 80s cartoon, but there was an action figure of him. Raphael seems to be the strongest turtle in this game, but you can choose whichever turtle you want to be to prove that you're the best one to take on Shredder. I like that you even get to fight Casey Jones in this game. There's a red ball that comes along in the stages to grab when you can do an ultra attack. It's a nice way to make the gameplay a little more interesting. Could this be the inspiration for the Smash Ball? For a tournament fighter on the NES, it's very impressive, especially since we were used to the likes of Karate Champ. Next up, we have Mario's Time Machine. Where do I even start with this one? I think most of us have been victimized by this game at some point. I have a vague memory of renting this on Super Nintendo as a kid, sitting in my living room, and being pissed. Anyway, after playing this on NES for this video, I think I'm even more angry now as an adult. The game was published by Software Toolworks. This is easy to remember because you see their logo like twice for an annoying amount of time, and it's unskippable. There's basically two title screens. The way they do this intro is one of the weirder ones I've seen on the NES. It's just really strange. First, you see what appears to be an Intellivision style start screen with Mario fonts, and then it goes through the developers with the Mario title screen thrown in the middle to tease you a bit, so you think you can press start and go into the game, but you can't. It's an extremely lazy version of the Super Mario World look, and it only gets worse. Mario rides Yoshi into Bowser's museum, which looks more like a cemetery or something. Writing this, I feel like this game should have its own video because I have a lot to point out, but for now, let's move on to what the game is about. Bowser has created time travel just so he can go back in time, steal ancient artifacts, and put them in his museum. So it's up to you, Mario, to steal his time machine and return the stolen items to their appropriate time periods. So history isn't altered forever. It's a very stressful situation. My favorite part about this game is when you're walking inside the museum. There are some really funny randomly placed portraits of Yoshi and Donkey Kong. Why would Bowser have these in his museum? I don't know, but they're there. Also, there's a really cute little statue. I want two of these outside of my house. You go in various doors to fight Koopas, and when you kill three, an item appears. You have to take the item back to its correct year, and it's not initially clear if you choose the right year or not. You just kind of jump around, and eventually you realize the level looks like it's missing something, so you go back and try again. If you get the right item, you can learn historical facts and you have to find the correct place to put the item. If you do it wrong, a bird comes and takes the item away, which makes you have to do everything over again and it's really annoying. There's angry Koopas and an enemy that looks like an onion version of one of those rockin' flowers you see outside of KB Toys in the early 90s. I like him. Overall, this is a product of the edutainment craze in the 80s and 90s and it sucks. The Jungle Book 
Some of my earliest console gaming memories include the Super Nintendo Disney titles published by Virgin Interactive, but this one was always overshadowed by Aladdin or The Lion King. Anyway, versions of this Jungle Book game were released on everything from the Master System to the Game Gear, so naturally it was on the NES. Like other Disney titles from Virgin, the game does vary based on the platform you're playing it on. This version is basically a slightly watered down version of the Super Nintendo one, which is to be expected. I haven't played the SNES game since I was a kid, but I think I like the NES version a bit better. You of course play as Mowgli and you're running around the jungle collecting fruit and avoiding angry animals. It's not great by any means, but the controls are fine and I like that you can throw projectiles in multiple directions. Very helpful for dealing with the enemies on branches above you. Tecmo Super Bowl! Tecmo Super Bowl was released back in late 1991 as a sequel to the home console port of Tecmo Bowl, and it remains a popular rental well into 1994. It was the first sports game to be officially licensed by the NFL, so people were really excited to finally be able to play as their favorite players of the time as it featured 30 real teams. So I'm not going to pretend like I've played this game a ton since I don't know anything about football, but there's plenty of deeper reviews out there for those interested. I do like that sunset in the intro though. Kirby's Adventure Kirby's Adventure is one of the most iconic side-scrolling platformers of the 8-bit era, so it's no surprise it was a popular rental. This was also the first time we saw Kirby in all of his pink glory, since before this he was white on the cover of the Game Boy game, Kirby's Dream Land. I know I flip-flop on my opinion about this game, but overall I'd say it's a fun, chill game. I mean, I totally understand the appeal of consuming your enemies and absorbing their powers. Kirby may be cute, but he's pretty darn deadly. Plus, the overall vibe and color scheme is just so darn wholesome. Even the enemies are cute. You know, despite having an indescribable, chilling aura about them. These guys always creeped me out as a kid and I still don't really like them today. I like the mini crane game, the twinkling music, and the fact that this little house totally looks like it's out of Rainbow Bright's Rainbow Land. Mega Man 6 Mega Man 6 was the last Mega Man title released on the NES, having come out in North America in 1994. It always boggles my mind when I think how insane it is that there were six titles in the same series released on the same console. So what else could this game have to offer that the other previous five didn't? Well, you of course get his abilities to do a power shot, and you have a slide like the last few games, but now they step it up a notch. The main gimmick here is Mega Man's flight suit. I mean, hell, it's right on the box cover. That's right, now Mega Man can fly! And I do struggle to call it a gimmick, because I'd say it's more than that, considering how well they incorporated that into the gameplay. Unlike some Robot Master power-ups, like Top Spin, the flight is actually very useful and fun to use. This seems to be a step up from Mega Man 5, and it's a nice way to cap off Mega Man's tenure on the NES. And lastly, we have Wario's Woods! Wario's Woods is famous for being the very last officially licensed title released on the NES with a release date of December 10th, 1994 in North America. It's also noteworthy for being the only NES game with an official rating from the ESRB. I feel this game does have a bit of a learning curve, so it takes a while to get a hang of it. You play as Toad and you need to clear out the monsters by matching them up with bombs of the same color. The bombs are dropped from the top of the screen and you can't control where they land, but you can rearrange the monsters and the bombs that have already fallen. If you press down on the d-pad, the bombs and monsters drop faster. Some people love this game, some people hate it, and I'm somewhere towards the meh side. It's not the worst, but I personally feel there are better puzzle games on the NES. So there you have it, a look at the top rentals for the Nintendo Entertainment System. 
What your system would you like to hear about next? Let me know in the comments and thank you so much for watching. See you soon. Bye.